Hey everyone. Hey, hey. Howdy. Hi. Welcome to Chicago Acapella's conversation about the history of harmony. I'm Matt Greenberg, Chicago Acapella's executive director. And this is really kind of a, um, it's kind of like a teaser for our ensemble's upcoming concerts with the wonderful Deke Sharon. Concerts on April 21st at the Harris Theater in Chicago and April 28th at the Mackinac Arts Center in Glen Ellen, Illinois. The concert's all about pop vocal harmony. And that's what we're going to talk about to do today with these amazing guests of mine who, uh, let me introduce you in case you don't know, Terry Hemmert yes. is our our radio legend from Chicago's WXRT. She's in the Radio Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's right. I, know, I only say it to you, Terry. And you can see by her background, she's also, I think, arguably the world's foremost expert on the Beatles. She's also an accomplished educator and taught a college course on the history of rock and soul for decades. Also, luckily for us, a choral music fan and a classical music fan. Her mom was a choir director. She grew up listening to that music and went on to sing in choirs for much of her life. And Terry created and narrated two concerts with Chicago Acapella about the history of rock and soul. And we're so excited to have you back today to talk to us about this one, Terry. It's good to be here. We don't have to sing, do we? Not yet. Oh, we'll see. Not we'll yet. see how it goes. Oh. Uh oh, I think they didn't tell us. <laughs> I'll, I'll sing. I, I'm shameless, so I, I, I mean, I've been singing since before I could speak. So I'm I'm on board, Terry. Sorry to well, throw you under the bus. I like to sing in a choral group. I don't like solo, and and I liked being an alto because I think harmony rules. To me, you know, yeah. that yeah. singing anybody can sing the melody. Sopranos, sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's it's doing that uh, harmony that really makes it richer. It's true. True. And for those of you that don't know, Deke Sharon, of course, is our guest for these upcoming concerts, The History of Harmony. Thrilled to be working with you on this, and um, who better? to work on the history of harmony with us than Deke Sharon, because he's literally known as the father of contemporary acapella. Um, in fact, if somebody says to me, which I hear all the time, oh, I love acapella. You know, when they hear I'm with Chicago acapella, oh, I love acapella. Probably what they mean is they love the work that Deke Sharon has done over the past 30 years. First, of course, he was a member of the House Jacks, one of the most successful acapella groups ever. He created the Contemporary Acapella Society, as well as the Recording Awards, the International Championship of uh, Collegiate Acapella, the Acapella Summit, and tons of other recordings, festivals, competitions, all of which really kind of drove this explosion of acapella music, especially on college campuses in the 90s, and it's still going on today. And then he brought that phenomenon to pop culture in a huge way with In Transit on Broadway and The Sing-Off on NBC and, of course, three Pitch Perfect movies. So, Deke, so excited to have you with wow. us, not just tonight, but for the concert as well. not worthy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I honestly thought it was entirely because I have a polo shirt the same color as your logo. It's so, true. I mean, I, that helps. No, no, I appreciate it, though. Well, I mean, for whatever reason you've had me here, thank you very much. Just for, <laughs> We're the, thrilled. Record, just for the record, I did not invent rock and roll. So he's got oh. yeah. I just okay. I'm just a fan. All right. Yeah, and I'm a fan of rock and roll too. You I'm, were, I'm, you playing with uh, Ike Turner on Rocket Sixty Six. Is that what you're what you're talking No, I think about? I was about three years old then. So but I am <laughs> yeah. a big fan of a cappella and so thank you for all you've done, Deke. Thank that you. is literally a labor of love, and I was not expecting for everything to blow up the way that it did. I just devoted my life to this new kind of style of acapella that uh -huh. I wandered into in college and um, just decided to devote my life to it. Because I, I always knew, like, if people only knew, if they only heard this, they would love it. 
and, and they did. Uh, overnight <laughs> success. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Fifteen years after graduating, all of a sudden, blam, everything goes goes crazy. So, yes, I'm just I'm just happy more people are singing. Well, it's great because you don't have to buy instruments. So you know, it's economical and artistic. That's good. Well, we can be the instruments. That's the beautiful thing That's about contemporary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need to. Buy it. Yeah. You can, I mean, I don't know if you've heard a lot of what's going on in contemporary acapella now, Terry, but you can oh, yeah. sound exactly like a trumpet or a muted trumpet and flute, uh, electric guitar, and then, of course, vocal percussion and all that. So, uh, yeah. Well, well, you know uh, who did that, be, except for the electric guitar, was the Mills Brothers. Of course they did. Of they started out did. like set, doing trumpet sounds and doing their own instrumental breaks. And yeah, and no one's, I, I think no one's done it better. I mean, the, the, the blend, the oh. harmony and the personality of the Mills Brothers. For me, the Mills Brothers are that music you go to when you're having a bad day and you put it on and you can't help but smile. Well, they are from Piqua, Ohio, and that's where I was born and raised. And my dad did their dad's plumbing. So I've got a major connection with it. <laughs> In fact, I always said that was our first Fab Four because I grew up listening to Mills Brothers records like a lot of uh, teenagers now grew up listening to their parents' Beatle records. That's great. And uh, we're all fans. It's nice to nice to expand your horizons. But the Mills Brothers, actually, it's too bad I, don't, I can't play a 78 record because when I was four years old, my mom set up the living room for a, a recording studio and she brought some guy in and that was direct, direct to disc. You know, the, the shavings were flying, you know, as the needle was going. And she had me sing Be My Life's Companion with the Mills Brothers record. And it's one take, you know, you no know, two takes. Yeah. And and I nailed it until uh, the end when the last note and and it was holding it and it kind of like a little dive. And the other thing is, I thought just an ad lib. If I clapped in the microphone, you could hear the clapping better. You know, that wasn't a great. Other than that, it was perfect. <laughs> and I used to play it in Rochester, New York. I had a '78. Uh, stop there on our, our turntables at work and we put it on a cart and we'd play it. My little four-year-old self singing with the Mills Brothers. Unbelievable. And I actually gave them a copy of the cassette when I met one of the times I met them. I'm sure they threw it out. It's probably the waste can, you know. So, <laughs> right. But they had a huge influence and the harmonies, that's what really got me. I just love and I think it's like with the Everly brothers when you get somebody that had the same mother, you know, there's a there's a built in blend that you can't get with uh somebody that you aren't related to oh absolutely it's a combination of the just your vocal instrument the overtones yes. are aligned because your 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 physical instrument is more similar but also a lot of it just comes from the way you pronounce words so there's nature and nurture in there when I mean, if you listen right. to the carpenters they had some very unusual kind of particular ways that they would approach certain vowels karen mm -hmm. carpenter being flawless in all ways but um that it, it's it's the combination of the two that ends up giving you that unbelievable resonant locked in harmony. Yeah, it's a family affair, really. A sly the family stone would say. Oh, but, really? uh, in fact, I read once, and I used to tell my students that the Mills Brothers. I told Don Mills this once. I said I trace all modern music back to the Mills Brothers, back to Piqua, and he started laughing. I said, "No, seriously." I said because you influenced the Everly Brothers. The er Everly Brothers influenced the way Lennon McCartney harmonized. The Beatles influenced everybody after them. I rest my case. And then after I told him that, I saw a, a documentary on the Everly Brothers. And they said, what's the first record you ever recorded? And they said, well, dad took us to one of those little phone booth like things where you can make a record for your mother for Mother's Day. And uh, and I played guitar and the, the two of the, the guys sang and they sang Paper Doll because they loved the uh, harmonies of the Mills Brothers. So he backed me up. I was so oh happy. That. Yeah. Well, and Paper Doll was... Um when we did our History of Rock and Soul concert with you, Tara, that was one of the songs that you chose as uh, being appropriate for that story. And sure enough, Deke chose that as one of the songs that's appropriate to tell the story of the history of harmony as well. So, uh, you know, well, it's did definitely... You the, did, did you ever see the... Uh, and people can get on YouTube after they listen to this civilizing uh, conversation. But 
uh, look up a N Mills Brothers paper doll. They have a great, it's like early rock videos, you know, MTV, like 40 years before that. And Dorothy Dandridge is like shrunk down and she's, it's like he cuts, uh, Don cuts her out like a paper doll, stands it up and she comes to life. And, and they're all looking like, they look like giants looking down at her dancing. And she was a great dancer, but, right. and that's the paper doll because the paper doll couldn't break their hearts. Right. You know? Right. Well, we don't have the Mills brothers. We do have just a little snippet of that performance from our rock and soul concert, which folks will get to hear this same arrangement on our history of harmony concert. So let's hear just a minute or so of, uh, of paper doll. that cute guy third from the left he was cute that young man yes that young that young man it was yeah a different, it was a different life Deke, aren't was, these guys great to work with though I yeah, mean, they're fantastic they're, they, they are they're like the jack of all trades they can do the anything skills of vocal music because they can sing flawless gregorian chant they can sing right. music from all around the world all these different eras and then they jump into jazz, pop, I mean, all these styles of, of 20th century and 21st century vocal harmony from around the world. No problem. Bam, 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 bam. No, just set them up and knock them down. So it's an absolute. They're amazing. Pleasure. And I've got yeah. an idea for the next one, Matt. We go from William Byrd to the birds. Oh, was, I like it. Nancy, do a I'm, you know, little four part. Wouldn't that be great? I'm and writing that down. It's for the birds. Okay. I think we should do birds tunes like William Bird. I think that the the you know we should go through and find homonyms like that and just do every style of music in the style of some other composer. There you yeah, go. That'd be cool. There, let's work on that. <laughs> While we were listening, that reminded me, you know, the the Mills brothers, I think I've got this right, Terry. Their dad, they sort of learned harmony from their dad who was in a barbershop group, right? Yes. And that's actually, you know, this concert sort of starts with the early 20th century styles and kind of moves through the decades. And that's one of the earliest styles that that's we true. cover. Still very much a thing today, barbershop yeah. music. Um, what can you tell us about that style and maybe why, I don't know, why is it still around? Well, well the first thing is people probably do not realize this. They see like the Dapper Dans on Main Street in Disneyland. They assume that Barbershop, because of all of the like funny memes that have come up in the past years or whatever, they assume it's it's a Caucasian musical style. It was not. It was created by African Americans back before the turn mm -hmm. of the century in the you know late 1800s. And this style of music was a huge thing. I mean, it blew up akin to what's, you know, happened around the Pitch Perfect era and pentatonic thing, things like that, or, or you know, going back to the doo-wop era when all of a sudden vocal harmony was everywhere. Barbershop was everywhere, but it was it was guys singing harmony, four-part harmony uh, on the latest pop songs of the day. I mean, back then it was Stephen Foster and, and, um, and contemporaries. But that style of four-part harmony was also unique because the melody wasn't in the top voice, as you hear so often in like, four-part hymns and Bach chorales and so much mm -hmm. uh, choral music, This the melody was in the second voice from the top, which mm. makes it a denser sound and a very unique way of singing harmony. In fact, that part is called the lead, as, as you might call it nowadays. Above it is the tenor, below it on the very bottom is the bass, and then the baritone sings around the melody, filling in that extra part, mm. resulting in some very crazy uh, vocal lines. And what's interesting is there are so many people singing barbershop today. There are actually more women in barbershop choruses and in barbershop quartets than men 
first of all. And there are more people singing barbershop outside of the U.S. than within it. So oh, wow. the statistics. So, uh, is I know, I know. Yeah. Well, also their dad uh, filled in when one of the brothers, Mills brothers, was uh, drafted during World War II. So that's why some of the videos you see a guy that's certainly older than the other. And uh, that's their that's their dad who came in off the bench. And <laughs> wow. And titter. Yeah. And that family, you know, once the once the Mills brothers came along in the 30s and 40s, of course, uh, jazz and swing music was the rage and vocal harmony kind of followed suit with that with the Mills brothers. But Terry, I think you were the one that maybe told me first about the Boswell sisters and that they were kind of important. I really didn't know much about them, but tell us about the, well, the I Bozzies. Don't, I, don't, I wasn't the one. I can't think. It wasn't you. Oh, I can't take credit. Sorry. Yeah. It's the it's the same sort of genetic thing, right? These yeah, sisters right. and brothers acts that had this amazing sort of uh, genetic vocal blend. Um, we talk about the Mills brothers. We talk about the Andrews sisters in the 40s. But then we get into doo-wop music and, and uh, the 50s. Love it. And I think before we go there, you touched on the whole gospel thing. Or the you know the uh, being an African and that started in the church, yep. uh, the the um, when I taught my course on uh, history of rock and soul, we spent a considerable amount of time with uh, music from the black church, and that's totally different than white gospel music from the same period, and um, and also the fact that it was liberation music, it was a double entendre when they were singing about Pharaoh. Uh, they weren't singing about some Egyptian guy. They were singing about the guy in the big house, you know, and uh, and also dealing with the the horror of, of their life, and they couldn't react or pr protest or try to escape. They could be killed. So they went to church on Sunday, and all those words had different meanings, and they knew it, and that was their outlet. Without that, my mom did a piece once called "Listen to the Lambs, Hear Them Cry." And, uh, you know, we think Lamb of God or, you know, Good Shepherd or whatever. And this uh, a, a black gentleman who was in the, this uh, community chorus she had in Piqua, he stayed after one night and said, Mrs. Hemmer, you know what that's about? And she said, no. And he said, it's about when the slaves were out picking cotton, they couldn't bring their kids with them. So they had like a daycare center right there so they could be with them on their break or whatever. And uh, without warning... Ever so often a cart would come along and the foreman would pick some of the uh, really um, strong and healthy kids, toddlers, most of them, put them in the cart, take them away to sell them. And the horror of that, if anybody is a parent or even has an imagination, the horror of that is unspeakable because they'd never see that child again. They would never have any way. There's no paper trail to trace them down. And, and, that the only outlet they had was to go to church and sing that hymn, listen to the lambs, hear them cry. They knew what they were singing about. The owner didn't. And that was their only outlet. So that's why that music is so intense. And then you see a lot of the doo-wop were kids, uh, black and white from the back, the, the poor neighborhoods or the ones where the schools weren't so great, great. And they didn't get that at school. They got it on the street corner. Or they got it in a men's restroom because the acoustics are perfect and they couldn't read music or anything. But this was such an outlet for them and just something to do other than be in a gang. And then they went on to a lot of success. It's amazing how this music is so powerful. And it's because it was more than just pop music on the radio. It was essential. And it was inspired. I think a lot of those groups were inspired by the Mills yeah. Brothers. I mean, sort of immediately inspired by them, weren't they? Because it sort of came right on the heels of that in, by the early 50s, early to mid 50s, I guess, right? Yeah. The late, well, the late 40s, you start hearing some of the, I just posted a song the other day that I just, I'm such a nerd. I'll go out and find songs I haven't heard before because I just keep wanting to hear more stuff. And it was the year I was born, 1948, and it's this guy never heard of. I even looked on Wikipedia, and they said very little is known about this artist, and they didn't have anything, no picture, no what, you know, they when he was born and when he died. And when, but 
it wasn't a harmony thing, but as I mentioned in my, I would do a song of the day on, on Facebook, you know, and some of them are well known and some classical all over the place, jazz. And, and sometimes I like to surprise myself and turn myself on to something I don't know. And I said, but you listen to his vocals and they're beautiful and it's so sincere. And that sort of sets a table for the lead singer of a doo-wop group because the sincerity and the, it's almost like a gentleman quality, you know, it's not tough. You know, these kids came from tough backgrounds, but when they sang, they, they went up someplace else that someplace they didn't live. And that's part of the, part of the strength of the music too. It got them out of that uh, crippling uh, with no good expectations life. And, you know, they were stars. They'd ride around, they'd meet movie stars, they'd ride trains, they'd go all over the world. And that's a life they, didn't anticipate so uh but this guy had that sincerity that you hear in doo -wop. It's beautiful so deke i know you had a, probably a hard time selecting which songs to include in this concert from this era because there are just so many but i know that earth angel is in there and that's probably one of the first beautiful. ones right that was really sort of mainstream pop that's right and it was uh one of the biggest also yeah and what you hear in, in the early stages of doo-wop is that lead vocalist being completely untethered. So the Mills Brothers set the stage, of course, right? So you go back to Barbershop, and the goal with Barbershop, there was, you know, there was a lot of call and response um, and a lot of pretty simple harmonies because it was an aural tradition. Today, now, Barbershop music's written down and complicated chord changes progressions all the time. But uh, as Barbara Shop progressed, it really became this kind of block of four-part har four part harmony. The, the lead line is your melody there, but the idea is to make these four individuals sound like one voice, which is so exciting. Um, when the Mills Brothers came along, they'd sing in block harmonies and the individual, whatever, but as soon as doo-wop flips in, you start hearing a soaring lead vocal that's less and less rhythmically ten, uh, like tethered down to what's going on yeah. to the point where the backgrounds would actually take over the melody and you got this floating ad lib of, of passion, like Terry said, that really reflected the heart and the soul of the era. And yeah. it's also interesting that in doo -wop music, you start to get a lot of nonsense syllables, some of which you can hear coming from the uh, scat singing or whatever, Ella Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong, you know, the jazz tradition. And also some of it is is just like exceptionally playful. They're having a lot of fun with it. So mm -hmm. that's a real trademark of doo -wop. In fact, just like Barbershop wasn't called Barbershop in its day and rock and roll, like the people making this early music weren't, didn't come up with the name, Alan Free did, right? When you hear doo-wop, that's, that's taken from some of those kind of nonsense syllables back when the voices and the background parts were starting to fill the role of instruments, which is so central to what's going on in contemporary acapella now. But they weren't imitating them so much as vocalizing them, making them a part of their instrument, you know, those rhythms and those uh, the churning energy that's built in uh, to those rhythmic instruments. Mm. And one of my favorites is Ink Spots, If I Didn't Care. And if anybody saw Shawshank, you know, that movie that was in the coming out of the radio at the beginning of the movie. Oh, and yeah. and you got your spoken word thing, which, you know, is come comes out of gospel. Uh and and the sincerity again of that the vocal. It's like this guy is, is pleading, you know, he's in love with this woman so much that it's not trashy at all. It's not like, come here, you know. Biosh, you know, it's, it wasn't hip hop. It was, it was really romantic. And, uh, and then the spoken word thing and, and, you know, and, and having the, that low voice that the temptations later on, you know, tapped in with that, but uh, just the, and his, his op, it was almost operatic. The guy is soaring, you know, and he embellished and he Im improvised like a scat singer in a way. But uh, to me, there's so much going on in that song. There's so many moving parts and so much of the future that you see in it that they were way ahead of their time. But to me, they were the link between the Mills Brothers and then all the great groups that came out of Atlantic Records, you know, like the Clovers and the Coasters and later the Drifters. They were amazing, too. Drifters are fantastic. And uh, but that that and also Chicago had a lot. And, and my favorite is the Dells. The Dells, uh, Oh, What a Night, 
That is one of the most passionate songs I've ever heard in my life. And then they came back in 68 when doo-wop was like considered like, oh, that's old people's music. And they had a hit with that song. They did a new version and they had like three different lead singers. They were passing it around. It's just stunning. Wow. You know, the original is really good and the remake and sometimes remakes are really stale. The remake was inspired and it was the original guys all grown up. Wow. Well, the other thing, of course, that happened in the the 50s was, you know, this is just pre-rock, like right before Bill Haley and the Comets came in with rock and uh, rock around the clock. You know, it was all crooners and pretty, you know, uh, croony kind of uh, squeaky clean kind of music. And there were a lot of pop hits with four guys, you know, the four lads, the four preps, the four aces. But uh, there were a couple I know that really stood out, right, Deke, that were sort of maybe a little bit more sophisticated than than the run of the mill. I think so. I, you know, there's there's a particular sound and an energy to a lot of these groups. But I think the one that probably, you know, holds the highest marks in uh, the vocal jazz world would be the high lows, in part because... Mm -hmm their arrangements were so clever and unexpected. And when you hear uh, life is like a bowl, bowl of cherries, like, you're like, wait, what? This was a pop song. And in fact, they weren't the most popular, but their bass and vocal arranger was Gene Perling, who if you've sung vocal harmony, vocal jazz, then you know that name because when he was done doing that, he took one of his buddies from the group, got an amazing soprano and Bonnie Herman uh, found a fourth, fourth guy and uh they started the singers unlimited who mm. were uh the ultimate overdub kings and queen of vocal harmony of all time and went into the studio and instead of making it about an untethered lead vocal that's soaring all or whatever it really became about the density of the harmony and for mm. those that are that are watching this and aren't really clear on what overdubbing is when you go back in time music really had to be made in the studio at the same time and they'd record a stereo track, and you really had two tracks you could, you could record to. In fact, when Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was recorded around 1967, you know, the, the masterful layers of orchestra and all of the, you know, bands and harmonies and all that, that was recorded on just four tracks, meaning everything that happened had to be put on one of these four pieces of tape. <laughs> and it, uh, it was shortly thereafter, and when you get into the early 70s, that you start getting 8, 16, 32 tracks, and you could chain them together, 64. And all of this is before digital recording by decades. But what it allowed to have happened, much like the Les Paul and, and Mary Ford, if you've heard those recordings, oh, where yeah. you, you've yeah. got like the guitar playing and then you know their own voices on top She's of each other. Harmonizing with herself, which is really hard. Exactly. That's what That's the singers really did often uh, with a big band, uh, but no. often with just themselves. And those acapella harmonies blew people's minds because they were taking the vocabulary of, of penis, like Bill Evans, these just like incredibly dense jazz harmonies that had never been vocalized before and uh, stacking them and building them out of vocal parts. So that's why I think the high lows have uh, held and stood the test of time. I'm a big fan of Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross, too. They're Absolutely. A totally, different, totally different thing. I and know. You know it's so clever. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross did well that I wish more people did is, okay, so if you listen to vocal jazz now and the vocal jazz programs and whatever, the Singers Unlimited world of vocal jazz harmony has really is really the dominant strain. In fact, it's almost the entirety of it. Um, you study how to make your scat solos unified, clear, lock those harmonies, match the vowels, and make a really clean and precise, um, gorgeous vocal blanket of sound. Right. Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, on the other hand, were almost like uh, bebop to the vocal jazz's That's swing right. bands, the density. They were loose, they swung. John Hendricks lyrics. They were so like, different from each other, too. It was yeah, like three yeah, different yeah. sounds. It wasn't like yeah. blending. So like right, that. exactly. So it's not about the blend. It's not about the perfectly yeah. aligned harmonies. It's about that, like, passion and fun, and, and it's and it's really jazz. And I wish there were more vocal jazz going on today that yeah. was in that vein. But I think people, um, it's probably too strong a word to say fetishize, but they, they obsess over perfection, 
-hmm. and the yeah. fear groups like take six who are remarkable oh. and beyond yeah. beyond yeah. reproach but the equivalent of that where it's loose and fun and funky and playful and crazy and exciting like hard bop was we don't really have that so sadly lambert hendricks and ross have uh remain icons on a path that should be trod more than it has been before. right so yeah i got to interview john hendricks on the phone in the early 70s and it was one of the highlights of my life he was just a lovely man and uh joni mitchell fans uh they they uh, should go back and re-listen to some of her albums because they were a big influence on her. In fact, she covered one of their, their songs. Wow. So um, and uh, yeah, they they were they were great. I remember in the early uh, probably late eighties actually, Janice Siegel from the Manhattan Transfer was doing a, a solo uh, appearance at the Fairmont here in Chicago, and I went to see her. And about halfway through the show, she said. I'm going to bring out a special surprise guest. Come on out. And it was John Hendricks. No. Mind blowing. Amazing. Right around then is when um, they put out their amazing, I think the greatest Manhattan Transfer album of all time called Vocalese, where they went yeah. right into that world. And in fact, yeah. that's when the Night in Tunisia arrangement they did with Bob McFerrin that won the Grammy that was on there. Yeah. And right. on that, John Hendricks does the Dizzy Gillespie part with his crazy lyrical vocally scatting going what on. How do you do that? I mean, None that's better. amazing. Yeah. There's, there's none Those better. Go out, what are you saying? <laughs> right. Exactly. And it's all words. It's another word. Exactly. I can't even pretend. I can't right. even, you know, recite the alphabet, you know. Right. You know, I can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's crazy. So there's a lot going on with jazz. This is an interesting question, actually, that just came in in the comments. I don't know if you guys have any clue. Somebody says that doo-wop continues to be very popular in Hawaii. I did not know that. I, if we needed another reason to go to Hawaii, I guess there yeah, is. Well, yeah, let's go. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, I mean, this is literally absolutely pulling a rabbit out of a hat as far as a guest is concerned. There is a a clarity and a simplicity to the harmonies that are fundamental to uh, Hawaiian music. And it's the Hawaiian popular style. So starting in like the 1970s up through now, like uh, Brothers Kaz and, and groups like this, there, the, the harmonic language of, of, of Hawaiian music is, is pretty straightforward. It's a lot of one, four and five, sometimes six chords or whatever. And that's really the harmonic language of doo -wop. And a lot of doo-wop parts were about repeating some kind of like an ostinato refrain with the same words that kind of like, you know, in, in the background. And that's also uh, what you hear a lot in in Hawaiian music and Hawaiian pop and the music and their harmonies. Back from the like the 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 hapa, you know, the hapa haole, you know, Al Alfred Apaka and then into, you know, Don Ho or whatever, but then post that. So I think it might just be that doo-wop has a lot of the same ingredients mm. so that it's you know delicious like mexican food and peruvian food like oh a couple changes but actually you know <laughs> there's some black beans and some spanish you know, I'm rice. Glad i tuned in tonight i'm learning something here this is so great important. but i'm making this up i mean also <laughs> but you know it fits uh in you know and then of course yeah. there's also a strong in hawaii there's also that kind of island reggae the, the, there's a, a connection to jamaican music and, and songs that have that strong mm -hmm. two and four backbeat and that kind of like island vibe the mid-tempo um with some harmonies over it as well so since i know that is a strong connection and those those musics definitely connect as well that's my guess about doo yeah. and why that's so strong there and for the record, I still say I'm waiting for that huge Hawaiian acapella group to blow up, to be the pentatonics of Hawaii or whatever. Oh, yeah. The money's there. You you create that group. Let's say you're on Maui. You will sing in every hotel. Every <laughs> you will clean up and make bank, make a couple of great albums, put the music out there, and then you will start touring everywhere the Hawaiian diaspora is or whatever. Like it's, that's, yeah. Yeah. everything goes south. I'm going to Hawaii. Absolutely. I'm I'm so go, yeah. Local yeah. boys. And because the, the harmonies and the sound, it's perfect for acapella. So, yeah. anyway, you probably said anything. That's my backup plan. I love it. I love it. 
So I want to talk about the I want to talk about the sixties because you know we've gotten we've talked a little bit about doo wop and at the end of the fifties, of course, when rock really hit the airwaves, vocal harmony really wasn't on people's minds for a few years as they were Elvis. getting into Elvis and you know really uh, all the the great solo instrumental and vocal uh, geniuses of early rock, but it kind of started coming back in the very late fifties and early sixties uh, when Motown uh, hit the hit the airwaves and um, so many of those songs on the radio then had great vocal harmony. So I'm wondering kind of what stands out to both of you guys from that phenomenon, from that era. Well, I think the the temptations were amazing. That was the next step after doo-wop. They sort of made it a little more modern, but, uh, and they didn't have just one lead singer too. That was unique. That like the Beatles, they didn't have one lead singer up to that point all the groups had a lead singer and then backup singers. Mm-hmm. Now we were talking earlier, Matt, about the, uh, a lot of the male singing groups from Motown and soul groups were more mm-hmm. like, you know, the, the roots of it, but the girl groups were more like the gospel because it was usually a lead singer and backup singers. It wasn't so much three or four part harmony. It was Diana Ross and then Flo and Mary were in the back stop in the name of love you know right. and uh and and that was and all the girl group stuff is is not really coming from that four-part harmony it's more like call and response so that's kind of a, a different you know different thing that we didn't even think of when we were hearing the music but uh, right yeah but yeah it really is a different sound and i mean there were tons of guy groups of course but also you know a lot of a lot of girl groups the supremes being the most Famous, I guess, but well, then the Beach Boys had amazing harmonies. The Beach Boys, my God, I mean, (laughs) you know, some of that early stuff too, you know, and and Pet Sounds that that album I can't listen to without crying. I mean, it's just uh, God only knows. And in fact, I saw a tribute to Brian Wilson years ago at Carnegie Hall as a DVD, and and Matthew Sweet saying God only knows, and I was by myself and I wept and I thought. You cry, baby, blah, blah, blah. So then they had Paul McCartney who couldn't show up and he loves the Beach Boys. They had him on video and he said, every time he hears God only knows, he weeps. And I felt better. <laughs> I thought if, if it Not makes just Paul you. McCartney cr- and he admits it in public, who am I to hide that under the bushel? Right, right. You know? Yeah. Well, we I know again it was it was tricky to try to find the right ones to pull from that era for this concert, Deke. But I know we're going to hear the Four Tops, we're going to hear the Temptations, the Supremes, oh, Marvelettes, and uh, we got the Ronettes in there. Be my baby, just because it's so great, and that, that is one of that the best harmonic songs hook. One of the best songs ever. Yeah, and that little thing. If you're dancing now, if you go to a dance, I don't know, father daughter dance of some of you guys. But if they play that and it comes to that drum thing at the end, dun, 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 you freeze. You do not keep dancing like an idiot. You freeze and then go back into it. <laughs> and and Ronnie Spector had one of the most incredible voices I've ever heard. And I got to interview her at Beatle Fest one year, the Fest mm-hmm. for Beatles fans, because she did have a connection with them. In fact, worked with uh, George Harrison on it a couple of recordings as a solo. Wow. And plus she said, you know, she was with that wacko husband of hers who happened to be a genius, but a sick puppy. Uh, and, and it, she said it was Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones and John Lennon were the two people that tried to say, Phil, you've got to let her out because they, he had her like locked into this mansion and he wouldn't let her have company or let her leave. And then the Ronettes opened for the Beatles on the 65 American tour. That was not Ronnie Spector singing lead. He put somebody else in there and everybody thought they saw Ronnie Spector. They didn't the the same backup singers, which were her sister and cousin, but uh, he wouldn't let her out. She finally escaped. I mean, literally escaped. Wow. But what a great voice. I mean, the, blows my mind still and just a lovely person too oh my gosh so maybe we should hear we do have a couple of uh a short medley of two tunes both of which are going to make an appearance on the upcoming concert as well um this is again from that same history of rock and soul show that we did with you terry 
And, you know, it is interesting to me how many things from the history of rock and soul dovetail into the history of harmony. Not all of it, but there's a lot of vocal harmony threads through there. And we pulled a few of them for this concert. So this is Please Mr. Postman and Baby Love. I remember Emily killing uh, Dancing in the Street. I mean, oh, yes. Martha Reeves and probably Faith. <laughs> man, those great singers. What yeah. fun people. They're great. Great Absolutely. to work with them. Aren't they great, Deke? Absolutely. I Wonderful. just love them. They're, they're a lot of fun. And I've seen them in other settings do like Renaissance music, you know, and, all, and they're so versatile. It's just great. That's, fun. That's what makes it fun, right? Lots yep. of different styles. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about the, the 60s here, and here we've got Terry Hemmert, and we've got the Beatles right behind her on the screen. Yep, so me. I feel like we need to pull them into the conversation, Terry, and like talk about you know how they relate to what were the, the subject of hand, vocal harmony. I know they were into it. Well, the thing is, they really blended well for not being related. I mean, the Lennon-McCartney harmonies when they would do a duo together it was just great and as i mentioned earlier they didn't have a lead singer which was very unusual they, they even george and ringo got to put a couple songs out there every so often and that was just unheard of i mean who let the drummer do one you know i mean really and uh and yeah the and Eagles, but, but go on <laughs> <laughs> so oh yeah Anyway, and Sarah Carpenter, and but but whatever, uh, I, I don't mean to take uh, away from what you're saying. Okay, from the thing. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, their, their harmonies were really tight when it was the two of them, and they would go on one mic. Wow, oh, that was for a Beatle fan, that was a rush just to see them like you know, singing like Babies in Black or something like that. But they also had that uh, uh, this boy on their first American album that you know, the meet the Beatles. It was with the Beatles over in England because they already met him. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and then years later they did it, sort of went back to revisit that on Yes It Is and that the harmonies on that. But then you get to Abbey Road and you get, you know, Deke's favorite there because, and, uh, and which is based uh, on a Bach piece that John heard, or Beethoven, John heard uh, Yoko playing Moonlight Sonata on the piano and he came in and said, oh, I love that. Can you play it backwards? <laughs> That's how I got up to doing that. And um, but also just uh, like Sun King and 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 the the medley. I mean, just the harmonies they had on that were they went deeper than they'd ever gone before. Right before breaking up, darn. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's just impeccable. But uh, the story is that Paul uh, was so uh, he's a stickler for 
perfection, which could be hard to work with. And, uh, and I guess the other three were ready to strangle him because they had so many takes of because. And it wasn't just three-part harmony like what they were used to when they would really try to do a harmony piece. They'd pull George in there so it wasn't just a duet. But they, they you know, tracked over and over and added. It was, it's like almost a choir, you know, it's all singing this different stuff. But, but it was so bad that they were ready to strangle him. And he said even later he uh, realized he'd gone too far that time, that there, <laughs> there were so many takes. They, and of course, they were on the brink of breaking up too so you know as neil sadaka said breaking up is hard to do right <laughs> and it was for them but but those harmonies were really something but they they were they did good harmonies even like uh on the first album there's a place that's the song that often gets overlooked but that it's a lennon mccartney uh composition too and boy they just somebody just mentioned uh crosby stills nash and young i remember yeah. hearing about Crosby, Stills, and Nash before, and Neil was in and out, you know, of course. But when they sang together, they blew each other away. I mean, they couldn't believe that the, 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 the harmonies were so natural. And one was British, and they were all doing a lot of drums. How did they make, <laughs> make a great music it, right. against all odds? But, you know, and then Neil brought something else in when he came in. He's amazing. But it wasn't so much harmony, so... Well, I grew up in the 70s, and uh, when, when we were thinking about that for this concert, Deke had the brilliant idea. There were so many songs on the radio in the 70s that had sort of vocal harmony as the, the main sort of that juicy hook. And so he created this combination of, I mean, you just hear like pieces of like all of your favorite songs from that era. And we fudged a little bit because Crosby, Stills & Nash... Uh, the Sweet Judy Blue Eyes actually came out in 1969, apparently. But it's in our 70s era. And so... Uh, close enough. And, yeah, it's close and, enough. And they really were established in the 70s. That was yeah. their first album. So, yeah. Yeah, the judge will let you go on that one. Okay, good. We're off the hook, Deke. I'm not a purist. Good, good, good. <laughs> well, it was still... It was still uh, like on the airwaves, obviously, but even more so, it was still on the charts in the in the early seventies. So, oh sure, sure. In yeah, fact, I, I was just talking to a, a kid last night, a high school kid who was uh, doing a report on uh, the Beatles and the Vietnam War. We had an interesting con, uh, you know, conversation on this, and um, we're talking. I said, "Well, you know, she wanted to know what Beatle album." I thought really connected with the trauma of what we were going through, and I said, "Definitely the White Album." because uh, the one before that, Sgt. Pepper, was all peace and love and summer of love and optimism and colorful and, you know, all that stuff. And and after that, Abbey Road was so professional, and, and I don't want to use the word slick because that makes it sound like it's lifeless, but, but it was just totally different than the White Album. But the White Album showed some of the chaos and, and anger and confusion and, and all that was going on. And it really reflected that in 1968. Um, but I said, in my class, we start the second semester with 1970. And the first genre we study is a singer-songwriter. And it's because after we went through all these assassinations and riots and the war, and it was just hell on earth. And we just wanted to get away. I mean, we just didn't want to be political anymore. And I'm saying we, meaning my generation. But wanted a house with a picket fence and a cat and an acoustic guitar. You don't want to get heady. And you start writing songs about relationships again and not about history and politics and civil rights and all that. Um, so uh, that's a reaction, a whole generation reaction where they went, well, that was traumatic. I need to chill. And that's why that music and then the harmonies, harmony makes you feel like you're in harmony with yourself and nature. I mean, yeah. it really it's like that Hawaiian thing, you know, where you just, ooh, and uh, and they needed that because they needed just to back off for a minute and take a take a breath. And that's when Joni Mitchell and Carol King and you know all those uh, James Taylor, they were all coming out with love songs, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's really reflected in a lot of the pop music that was on the radio. I mean, obviously there was punk going on and there was disco going on but there was this sort of undertone of this kind of more gentle sweet 
mm-hmm. music that was on the radio. And yeah, a lot of it had great vocal harmony. And even some of the, you know, some of the rock stuff had really great vocal harmony. Mm-hmm. So we're going to hear a little, you know, electric light orchestra and some Fleetwood Mac and some Kansas and along with Crosby, Stills and Nash, we've got kind of a, a, a hodgepodge all over the, all over the map in the 1970s. I can't that's wait kind to of hear that. <laughs> you must have been up all night, Deke. I tell you, working no, on it's, that. It's actually incredibly easy that that really? medley could have been fifty songs long, seventy songs Honestly. long. There are so it's many all night, huh? Hooks. <laughs> I, know. I think that's the year where, like, the hook is the harmony, and the melody is inseparable from those harmony parts. Think about the Eagles. Think about the Bee Gees. These are not about one person singing. They're about the group, that group sound. And um, Um, you only need like two seconds seconds of it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, All you need is a couple seconds of it. You're like, okay, you know the song, you know the moment, and it grabs you and it pulls you right into it. Yeah. Um, And hooks are, you know, people think, oh, hook, but sit down and try to write one. I mean, that's the hardest thing to do is to write a hook that people, and, and, and a good hook really hooks you in. I mean, you know, I remember the first song that I ever went and bought with my babysitting allowance, uh, went to buy after hearing it only on the radio once. Because buying a record when you're poor, you just couldn't go out and buy everything you liked. You had to hear it several times on the radio to see if you. And I remember hearing Heat Wave by Martha and the Vandellas, first record I ever heard from them. And I went right down to Murphy's Dime Store. And bought that record and never regretted it, never looked yeah. back. But that kind of uh, overwhelming, and and it was like a it wasn't Phil Spector, but it was like a wall of sound of mm-hmm. vocals and intense and just like and exuberant, like a heat wave. You know, it's just like so happy, <laughs> and it was contagious. And, and so I, I, I blew my dollar. You know, <laughs> no, no returning it. Well, hey, we're getting close to uh, to the the hour mark here, but we can't stop the conversation since we've got Deke with us. You've got to tell us some pitch perfect stories, Deke, or at least you know what we're going to be hearing in the concert and what that was like for you. I know that it's a a very special arrangement of something that people will know from the movie, right? Absolutely. I thought the way to wrap it up is to uh, wrap it up with the finale from the movie, which was an arrangement that caused me no shortage of headaches the, the whole acapella boot camp for the first movie was actually like looking back on it now it was the perfect storm of of uh are you kidding me because I, I i spent my whole life spreading harmony through harmony and trying to popularize this music but we were making a low budget movie with first time movie producers first time director he'd only worked on broadway beforehand no one had ever made an acapella movie before and nine of the ten bard and bellas not only hadn't sung acapella before they didn't even sing in choir. These were like comedian actresses who were hired who could like sing a melody, but their their vocal blend was impossible to put together. So, you know, Annie Kendrick with her Broadway voice and Annie Campus kind of this point too, and Esther Dima's is this, you know, raspy kind of a voice. And then, and the Re- Rebel Wilson with the Australian vowels. I mean, God help me. I got like two hours of sleep a night for like the <laughs> And the troublemakers had a couple leads from Broadway. And then the rest of them were like, it was backfilled with like local college acapella guys. Give me mediocre college acapella singers. I'll make them great. This is what I do. It's not a problem. But I had to build the best, the sound of the best women's college acapella group of all time, like legendary from these incredibly disparate pieces. And it was it was nuts. I mean, the director pulled me aside and be like, Deke, you know, women need to win the movie. So <laughs> right. Talk. But somehow it came, it all came together and the shaft of light in the end. And they started to learn. I had to learn how each one of them learned this person needs sheet music. This person yeah. is learning. This person has their own way of notating music and private lessons with each one of them to like bring them together. Uh, but anyway, that bringing together of things was not just of their voices, but also of all of the themes in the movie and mashing them up at the end. And by the end, there were like seven different melodies all woven together from different points in the movie and and whatever. And so it was this chaotic arrangement where the director, Jason Moore, kept coming. You know, I kept bringing the arrangement. He'd be like, I want more. I'm like, are you sure it's not too much? More! So I'd come back to him and he'd be like, more! Like a bad <laughs> And then finally, the final arrangement I brought him, he's like, 
it's a little bit too much. And the thing that I was worried about, no one's ever made a movie of it. Like the magic of acapella happens in the room. There's this like incredible power and everybody knows it from the holidays and you hear harmonies and you're wrapped up in it, but it doesn't work on screen the same way. So we had to figure out how to like make all these pieces work. But also I was like, it's so many layers and so many storylines and so many snips or whatever, but I didn't fully understand and recognize I, I made, made the TV show, the sing off, but we weren't editing like that. We weren't cutting. And then you cut to this person and then that person looks at her boyfriend, and then he smiles back and then boom, boom, boom. So you can tell incredible stories with, with, um, you know, in the editing room or whatever. So in the end, it all, it all worked out, but I was, Terribly worried that the entire movie was going direct to DVD and nobody would see it. Thankfully, that uh, awkward really gods shone down uh, love and and uh, and I'm lust. Stressed and, out for you, just I know, me. right? It's making it me was, sweat. Yeah, I'm like, and I'm telling the like nice version of it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, there was no, there was like, I mean, like, just no money. I just like living in like a, like a motel room near like a hospital where people were coming out with their walkers and smoking in the entry. And you're like, is this really what's happening now? Yeah. Oh my God. But it that's also, me, that's and actually, right it, there. You yeah. making yeah. the second about movie. movie. Right. Making the second movie was a dream come true because I knew how to teach them all. And it was like, you, yeah. you make a movie and then it doesn't come out for a year later. So then the first chance I got to see all of them was like when we started the second movie. I was like, we oh, did yeah. it. Can you believe it? And then making the second movie was an absolute, it was a piece of cake because I knew how yeah. to learn, yeah. arrange exactly for the voices, run the rehearsals together, record them right there. Beautiful. Easy. Wow. Like, yeah. You were, you were uh, in, you're like a, the Thomas Edison of singing, you know, you were making, drawing stuff out. I, is out of, and will this work? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it was a little bit like that. And the thing, you know, for people who are listening, it's like, well, but they all have great voices. What's the, what's the catch? The catch mm. is in acapella, there are no instruments and yeah. all the singers are the backgrounds all the time, but you need some measure of blend and blend yeah. comes blend largely from great. matching yeah. vowels, matching phrasing, matching the words right. and all that. Um, and for solo singers who hadn't done that blend, like like Terry was mentioning, the Beatles, like you, you wouldn't expect these people, or especially Crosby, Stills, and Nash, like these are people from different parts of the world, different yeah. backgrounds, they speak differently or whatever, but right. there was something about their voices that just naturally, magically aligned. Yeah, and really, it surprised them. It surprised. I them. can guarantee you that the Barden Bell is. I've I've recordings maybe released upon my death. Like when they first got together, it was not like that. <laughs> <laughs> at all. I love them all. I mean, and they'd admit it. Like they were like, I, I think almost all of them cried at some point during this process. And I couldn't have been nicer about it all. But they were just like, I can't do it. It's too hard because it's hard. It's yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. And I used to think that choral people, traditional classical choral people, turn their nose up at contemporary a cappella because we're like, oh well, that's pop the music. It's not, you know, no. important or whatever. And there may be a piece of it, but a lot of them stayed away from it because they're like, it's too difficult. It's just <laughs> complicated because like where do you breathe and all these different background syllables flying sure. by and often the it's ranges like, are sometimes very you know like the sopranos are, are often very low have to sing low like it's it's a lot and it's yeah. like magic when it all comes together and it's singing yeah. without a net right there's no safety net like anything like when we did the sing-off if yeah. a song falls apart it falls apart yeah. it is gone so you can't um, have the orchestra pick it yeah. up and go no, yeah. people are nervous my mother, like my mother was a choir director so i grew up as a child blending the, yeah. the, you weren't a soloist you weren't supposed to if, if somebody said oh i could hear your voice you'd think oh i'm doing it wrong you know i mean she would have thrown something at me if that had happened <laughs> a sharp object to aim, aiming uh -huh. for my head you know i mean uh she, right. you know blending was and nobody standing out and you know even with the doo-wop and stuff it, it's you'll have the lead singer sometimes, but boy, it just blends right. and nobody's showing off. Everybody's it's a team sport. Team yeah. sport in the biggest way. Hey Matt, I noticed there's one great question in the um the comments that, that yeah. we got to, but I think now's a good time. How has social media impacted acapella? Is it all for the good? That's interesting. Listen, contemporary acapella has so much to to thank within social media. In fact, if you go back and you look at one of the first ever viral videos. It was straight no chaser. These guys mm. recorded a concert around the holidays 10 years before. They released it on early YouTube, and the 12 Days of Christmas went viral 
Atlantic Records called them. They thought it was a prank. Atlantic Records called and said, hey, you guys want to make a Christmas album? They all had day jobs and stuff. And then they were like, okay. So they recorded that. And like, you want to try a tour? Okay, we'll try it. They're, they're going strong. You're a little Straight No Chaser album up behind me. Um, yeah. They're still like on the road. They had their best year yet last year. So they're doing great. Wow. And wow. it makes the, the sing-off was great for them. But it was those videos they made afterwards where they were like sitting on their couch and they're singing, they're building a, a fan base. The beauty of the internet is that it allows kind of direct to consumer. People can make music and then and then they can find their fans, whatever the style is, wherever they are around the world. And uh, believe me, in my college dorm room, on my hands and knees, stapling newsletters to send out to different people to try to bring this this acapella community together. Once the internet took off, even the early days of the bulletin boards where people could like chat and talk, like sure, that's sure. that was the beginning of everybody being able to really come together and support and learn from each other and build this wonderful, wonderful international uh, community of, of vocal harmony. So it's it's made all the difference and it's and yeah. it's uh, a blessing. Yeah. In some ways it couldn't have happened, at least not in the way that it did without that. Without and it, that, yeah. And then you've got YouTube. So if anybody wants to go back and hear the doo-wop and, and the Mills Brothers, it's yes. right there. It's yes. right there. And, and yeah. I love it. And I use that a lot in my class. It was like a multimedia show. I would have right. a, a, a student uh, assistant, and she would he or she would load all the songs in there. And, and I did three hours of stand-up comedy and teaching and inspiring. And I was part preacher, part comedian. And give her the cue and she'd play if I didn't care for a minute and a half. And then I would take it on to, you know, the clovers and go from there. And it was like a, it was like a multimedia show. Yeah. You know, I never had problems with kids looking at their, their um, phones. phones. You, know, yeah. they, you know, it's a lot of classes. A lot of teachers say, what do you do to, Oh gosh. Okay. I got to tell the story. I, I doubt the woman is watching this. So, but somebody was doing a faculty meeting and said, what do you do about the phones? You know, cause kids these days are always in, you know, I hate kids. So somebody says kids these days, I leave the room, <laughs> and uh, you know, live with them. They're great. You know? And, and so uh, she said, I have a basket and they put them in, you know, and then they take them out and they leave. What do you do? And I raised my hand and I said, I'm compelling for three hours. Not a problem. <laughs> compelling. And I told my students and they all laughed. They said, yeah, we can't look at our phones. We're going to miss something. I said, Great. Bingo. Great. Thank you. Bingo. You know, make them to real life. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. But it is a help though. I think it, we have a, a, one of the things I was a big uh, fan of the animals in the sixties and uh, they, tapped in into blues, you know, and I didn't know anything about blues. A small town, Ohio. And one of their songs that turned me on to the blues was the the composer credits was J.L. Hooker. And I thought, who's that? And you couldn't go to the library and say, who's J.L. Hooker? And the yep. teen magazines just talked about what John Lennon liked to eat for breakfast, cornflakes, you know, <laughs> I remember that. But, um, you know, there was no place, no internet where I could get on and do a search. Who's J.L. Hooker and why should I care? And boy, you know, I had to move to Chicago to go to Old Town and buy a compilation of, of blues records to finally hear John Lee Hooker. Waited a couple of years for that. And then, boom, became a lifelong blues fan. And uh, But now it's so much easier because if a kid hears about, oh, J.L. Hooker. Oh, it's John Lee Hooker. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Yeah. You know, Wikipedia. Boom! <laughs> you know, and Absolutely. then you can go hear a, a video. I mean, you can teach your own music history course. And there's stuff, even we get in the Carter family and all that stuff, you know, where there aren't any videos because they, they weren't making videos then. But, you know, t the songs are on there and you can hear the songs. And it's, it's a great, uh, I told the kids that that class is not okay, you finished it, you're done. This is just the beginning. I'm just tweaking your imagination. And now you've got to go the rest of your life and, and search out stuff. Like some one, one thing will lead you to another. Right. So follow it. Go down and the rabbit hole. Yeah. It's like I was doing Classic Encounter once and I was doing Mahler's Fifth. And I went deep, 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 deep. Finally found a group of German college students playing one of the themes 
on Heineken bottles. It was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes a great teaching tool when you're trying to draw people in who have no idea who Mahler is or what it's uh, about. And to see the and, and and also then they feel comfortable. They feel like, oh, I belong here. You know, yeah. all these people like snobby, like you don't know Mahler, you know. No, right. you can this out. And then they heard that theme. They heard the symphony play it later right. on, and they thought, oh yeah, the Heineken theme, you know. And uh, and as a teacher, I was always looking for stuff like that. Just make it. Well, fun. I, I know that you know when you worked with us on our concerts, Terry. That that was that was the effect you had. I mean, I know that people left those concerts. And went straight to the internet to look up a bunch of these groups and a bunch of these songs. And so we kind of hope the same thing's going to happen with the oh, history sure. of harmony. You know, we I hope that people are going to, you and, know, and go he, listen he to the Whip so and Poofs and the Boswell sisters so cool. and all these folks. He was so cool that he invited my whole class, Compton, to one of the, the, the and, and, and I said something funny was in the script that they got more than anybody you could hear this one group up in the balcony over to the left. They were all laughing because they were my students, so they really got it. Right. They were really great. But yeah. But well, I think looking- this is really great to meet you, Deke. I just uh admire your work and, and I love a cappella. Love a cappella. It's just great. And these guys do it. I'm so proud of them being in Chicago and all. They're so good. Well, we're excited to do it. We've only got, what, four four weeks or so before the first show on April 21st at the Harris Theater, and then the following Sunday, the 28th, out at the Mackinac Art Center in Glen, Illinois. And I know that we have a um, special <coughs> discount promo, a special code that you can use if you'd like to get a little discount on your tickets. you got to do it fast because I think this is limited time only. But check that out. We hope we will definitely all see you there on April 21st or April 28th. Deke, can't wait to see you on stage with our singers. Terry, I know you'll be there along with me in the audience cheering them on. First one, I'll be in New Orleans the next week. That's right. That's right. (laughs) See you at the Harris. Well, thank you guys. I can't thank you both enough for uh, joining me tonight to talk about History of Harmony. It's been really fun. We could talk about this for hours, but we'll we'll continue it. And we will. Okay. Absolutely. Have a good night. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Peace and love, as Ringo would say. (laughs) Right.